family. It's good to see you all here today and in your Christmas sweaters for some of us wearing, whether they're ugly or cute, whatever style you have this morning. want to welcome those online as well joining us. Hey, church family, here in the room, can we give a round of applause just to welcome those watching online because they are a part of us as well. And so we want to say thanks for watching on those watching online too. Well, we are wrapping up our two-weeker uh, of lament in peace during Christmas. And if you want to turn somewhere in Scripture, which will be our home base, you want to turn to the Gospel according to John, which is found in the New Testament. You got you uh, immediately about two-thirds of the way through your Bible, you've got the New Testament. And there's four guys right there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They write about the life of Jesus. So you want to turn to John 16. That's where we're going to land today. And so when you get there, just hold that spot for a moment. Just a little few cool nuggets about this guy that the letter that we're going to look at. John was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He was a follower of Jesus. He was probably the youngest of the disciples. John had a very close relationship with Jesus. In fact, we are told in Scripture that John likes to refer to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. So there's a special connection there. Not only was John uh, one of the 12, he was part of Jesus' inner three. And so you have uh, John and you have James, John, oh my gosh, brain fight, Peter, duh, Peter. He's like the leader of all of them, right? So there it is. Also, Jesus' inner three, and John is, gets to be a part of it. And so we are going to look at what John has to say. John's cool because John, John's an eyewitness to the life of Jesus. Like he spent the years with Jesus and he writes his letter for you and I today. Uh, I can't believe, can you believe it's almost already Christmas? Like I can't believe that, that here it is basically uh, a week away from Christmas. I don't know about you, I don't feel like it feels like Christmas outside, right? It's warm. They're mild, not warm. It's mild. There's no snow. Some of you are like, hallelujah, <laughs> right? I say this, you live in Michigan. If you don't like snow, move south, okay? Just move to a southern state. You don't have to deal with snow. But we live in Michigan. We need snow. <laughs> That's what I just said. I do agree snow should stop at a certain point. At a certain point, it should stop. But it's Christmas, and there should be white stuff out there. Yes. All right. We're gonna, I, don't forget, Christmas service is next week already, right? Don't forget, we have a Saturday service at 6, as Pastor Josh talked, and then our normal time Sunday morning. So you choose. You pick what you want. They're all the same. They're all candlelight. It's going to be a great time together. You ever ask yourself this question? Does this holy God see me? Why does it feel at times I don't have peace yet? We understand in Scripture that God... Jesus and the writers say, talk a lot about peace. Is there is this peace that surpasses all understanding. How come at times it feels like I don't have that? Last week, if you were here, we talked about this idea of lament. And we looked at a book that is entirely about lament called Lamentations. Lamentations 2.1, we talked about this, and this is what it said last week. How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. It feels that though as times you and I are under this dark cloud, doesn't it? It feels like some of us, there's seasons that it just feels like I can never get out from underneath this thing. For some of us, we're on a high, spiritual high, a life high. Life is going well. But I promise you, one day, sooner or later, you will run into this cloud. Do you know why? Because we live in a sinful, broken world. That's why you and I will enter a season of this. Because of sin in this world. But I love that in the midst of the cloud... The writer of Lamentations just doesn't sit there and wallow with the cloud. The writer of Lamentations give us this promise that we looked at last week. That in Lamentations 3.22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. You're loved in the midst of that cloud. Whether you feel it or not, God's love is right there. And if you have the cloud over your head, you know this, his mercies never come to an end. 
Every day you wake up, there is new mercies for you. This cloud doesn't define you. Only God gets to define you. And you and I hold on to the promises of God that his love never ceases and his mercies never come to an end. You and I grab a hold of that during a season of the cloud. But oftentimes, the cloud comes and we forget those promises. And I love what a guy by the name of Paul writes this to the Christians in Colossae, which is a city in modern day Turkey. It's Colossae, we have the letter he writes to those Christians in the letter of Colossians. And he's writing to Christians. And this is what he's reminding the Christians to do. It's almost as if they're gonna forget about this. And Paul says, I need to instruct you, brothers and sisters. I need to instruct you, those in the faith. I need to instruct you on how and where your mind gets fixated. Because isn't it true, our minds can get fixated on the dark cloud above us. And that's all we see. And Paul writes to those Christians in Colossians chapter three, and it says this, he tells the Christians, set your minds on, what are those two words? Things above. above. Not on earthly things. Not on earthly things. And if we're honest, when a cloud comes, don't we just focus on that? It's, it's very easy to lose sight of who our Heavenly Father is when the cloud is over us. And Paul is writing to the Christians, set your mind on the things above. Don't have your mind set on the earthly things or the cloud that is over your head. Please be reminded that heavenly things are greater than earthly things. And it's where your mind gets fixated when the troubles of life and the problems of life come that will dictate if you stay in the cloud for too long or does your mind get set on the heavenly things that you can endure the cloud. It's up to you. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. A little bit later in Colossians chapter three, he gets to this idea of reminding those Christians in Colossae who they are in Christ. Because I realized this, man, there was some healing last week. I'm gonna say that. There was healing in this room last week. And in the midst of this, I think when the cloud comes over us as Christians, it's easy to forget who we are. And Paul writes and he says this. So if you've been raised with Christ, he's reminding them, listen, you, brother, sister in Christ, you've been raised with him. You get that? And then I did some research. I'm like, what does it mean to be like raised with Christ? I wanna know. And then I, yeah, you gotta look at the life of Jesus and actually get to it. And I promise we'll get to John 16, by the way. We'll get there. What does it mean to be raised with Christ? So we gotta look at Christ's life. Three things I wanna point out to you. Here are the three. Raised with Christ. Number one, Jesus left the tomb, so should we. Some of us are far too long in the tomb of sin where Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit has given you the ability to get out of the tomb, but you're still stuck in the tomb. And you wonder why you wallow in the dark cloud that's over your head. You wonder why. Because you're still stuck. I'm wondering there's someone in this room that Jesus is calling you today to enter into his salvation and he's gonna take grave clothes off of you today. I believe it. And I'm gonna say right now, our pastor John believes it. If you know you need a relationship with Jesus Christ, get out of that tomb. Come see Pastor John right here in the corner. He'll lead you into a prayer. You can do that now. You can do it as the close of the service. But there's some of you, you know, Jesus is calling you out of that tomb. He's calling you out of that tomb. We gotta rise up. Come on. Number two, Jesus had supernatural life, so should we. The power that rose Jesus out of the tomb was the Holy Spirit who now resides in Christians. He is in you, through you, all around you. 
And you wonder why in the midst of the cloud over our head, it feels like we're just trying to rely on the self and not the power of the Spirit to guide me through this. And the last is Jesus looked to heaven. So should we. And it's so easy to get caught up just looking at the cloud and not seeing him. Because it's easy to get our minds fixated on the troubles and sufferings and pain and grief of life when our eyes should be on the Father. Now, it doesn't negate what we go through. Remember what I said, we live in a sinful, broken world. We'll go through dark seasons. But know your identity in Christ. You are raised with him. Leave the tomb. Live a supernatural life. Get your eyes to heaven. Here's what happens if we don't. We stay in the tomb, we rely on self, and all we're looking at the cloud. That's all we look at. And so when that season does come, know this. It will come. If you're not in it, there will be a time where it feels just there's, there's suffering, there's pain, there's grief, there's loss, there's things of that nature. And some of us are there right now in that moment. Get your eyes on Jesus Christ. He is your foundation. Hold on to the promises of God. In Colossians 2.20, it says, if you died with Christ, to the elements of this world. Get that? Oh, oh, this is good. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as still you belong to the world? Who's he writing to? Christians. Yes, believers, first generation of believers. This is what's so amazing about it. He's like, hey Christians, you're still looking like the world. And I've realized something. So do we. When storms come, we have a tendency also to look like the world. Hold on to that thought as I hold on to my umbrella for just a moment. If you've died with Christ, you've died to the things of the world. Hold on to that thought. Let's go back one. So if you've been raised with Christ, watch this, seek the things above which is this idea of seeking, it's to aspire, to desire, and have a passion for the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Your eyes should be fixated, your life should be passionately seeking the things of God in heaven. And here's what happens. The storm comes, the pain, the suffering, the trial, the grief. And we don't like it. So we get out the umbrella of life. Because you don't like the storm above you. Now, side note, us glass wearers, we love umbrellas when it's raining outside. It is like the worst thing to be a, a wearing eyeglasses and it's raining. For those of us that care about our hair, we love umbrellas too. But outside of that, this is how we tackle Life, when the storm comes, we grab the umbrella. We want to get out of this thing. So this thing becomes a symbol of hurry. Run around, do a bunch of things so you don't have to deal with that cloud above you. Run around and just be busy because busyness will surely pretend like the cloud's not there. This umbrella can represent media. Being consumed with all sorts of media, news outlets. Being consumed with Instagram and Facebook and scrolling just to numb life. So you don't have to go through the cloud. This umbrella represents Excessive consumption of alcohol to numb the pain and pretend like everything's okay. And I just down one after another after another so I don't have to face the reality of the cloud. This represents gossip. 
Because if I can talk about someone else and make their problem seem bigger than mine, mine's not bad. And what does Jesus say? You're dead to those things. I am dead to the things of this world. You cannot be, I believe in scripture, born again Christian, regenerated by the spirit of God Christian and still hold on to the things of an unregenerated person. Because either these things are Lord or Jesus Christ is Lord. Master, you cannot serve that idol and Christ. And there are a lot of Christians who believe they're saved. And one day, as Jesus says, you thought you knew me. I didn't know who you were. But Lord, we prophesied in your name. We did miracles in your name. I never knew you. And unfortunately, go away from me. I'm just curious that there to be a Christian is to live a crucified life, to allow these things, these addictions, these certain behaviors that we grab just to manage life when he already gave us someone. His name is the Spirit. Why do we keep picking this stuff up? Because I think sometimes we lose our identity in the cloud. I wonder why Paul said in Romans 12, he's writing to Christians, the Christians in Rome. He says this, Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think there's a lot of just meat there for us. And in that meat, some of it is because you are, you, this is all you have known is to grab this thing to survive in life, but with Christ, with the Spirit of God living in you, you can now transform your mind. When the storm comes, I don't pick this thing up anymore. I run to my Savior, I hold on to his promises, and Jesus Christ is my firm foundation. And I can manage the storm. I can face the storm, not try to numb my way out of the storm. Some of us are praying our way out of the storm when God's trying to use the storm to transform you. You're praying away your miracle and blessing. Don't get me wrong. I don't really like those things. (laughs) Please don't hear my heart. Those aren't fun seasons to walk through. But where are your eyes in the midst of it? I told you we'd eventually get to John 16. So here we are now, John 16. The question I have for us as we enter into John 16 is this. And then I have three short points. Is it truly possible, Pastor Ryan, to have peace in my life? Is it truly possible to have this peace that we read about, we sing about the peace of God? Is it truly possible? Jesus' last, some of his last words, oh, I love this. Some of Jesus' last words to his disciples, it's his last teaching moment, last discourse before Jesus goes to the cross. He's in the upper room and he's gonna teach his disciples. I mean, he is hours away from being betrayed. Hours away from being arrested and mocked and spit on. He is hours away from being beaten with a crown of thorns put on his head and nailed to a cross. He is hours away. So you want to lean in when you know that and know what is Jesus trying to leave his disciples with before his crucifixion. And John chapter 16 gives us a sneak peek. And this is what he says in John 16 verse 33. Jesus' words, I have told you these things so that in me you may have, what's that word? Peace. Peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous, I have conquered the world. Here's the ugly and beauty of what Jesus is saying. You will have trouble in the world, that's the ugly, but peace in Christ, which is the beauty. I know I will have trouble 
I will have problems and the storm is going to come. But in the midst, God's, Jesus' promises, I can have peace in him. And we got to get a clear definition of peace. Peace is not the absence of problems. I know we all wish that, right? We wish it, but it's not. Peace is the awareness of God and his promises in the midst of our problems, It's the understanding of who this God is, that he is my foundation, and I know who he is. I I know the promises I'm holding on to as I face trials, as I face grief, as I face pain and problems in my life. My Jesus is there. Notice what he says. It's so cool. That's because Jesus is cool. That's what, look, look at this. Jesus says, I've told you these things so that, what are those two words? In me, in me, you may have peace. Here's the thing. Only peace is found in Jesus Christ. And you know it. Brother, sister in Christ, you know that. Here's the unfortunate thing. People may follow Jesus yet deny themselves this peace. But why is that? Because if peace is only found in Jesus, the storm comes. And we go back to picking up the things of the world. And I'm following after Christ and wondering, why don't I have this peace? Why do, why do I see my brother and sister always have peace in storms? Why do I? And we don't realize because you're not dead to the things of the world yet. You're still turning to your addiction that Jesus died a horrific death to give you freedom. And if you, listen, if you don't think you can beat your addiction, I'm gonna tell you right now, you believe the power of sin is greater than the power of Christ. There is nothing like the power of Christ. He defeated your sin already. May you and I, we don't forget who we are. Don't forget who we are in the storm. Peace is only found in him. It's no longer the shopping. It's no longer the gossiping. It's no longer the social media scrolling. It's no longer the addiction. I'm dead to that. And only peace can be found in the storm in Jesus. And Jesus says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things. Question. Well, you and I got to figure out what those things are then. Because he says, I've told you these things in order for you to have peace in me. Let's go find out what these, three, what these things are. Three quick things that Jesus teaches his disciples so they will have peace. Number one, hold on to these three. I'm gonna tell you, I shared my heart last week with Lament. I think this is coming also from my own experience. I've walked this. I kept telling people, I'm having amazing quiet times with God in the morning. But I still had a cloud over my head, though. But I was still founded on Jesus Christ. Hold on to these three things. There's nothing like it. Number one, you are loved and liked by the Father. Do you believe that? Do you actually believe the Heavenly Father loves you? He likes you. Look at what Jesus teaches his disciples, John 16. He says, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. And I have believed that I can't, and I believe that I, and you believe that I came from the Father. He loves you. He absolutely is in love with you. Get this, friends. Family, we have an eternal perfect Father who consistently loves you. In that love, you can have a deep abiding peace in his security of love. God delights in you. God has a deep, affectionate, loyal love to you. So when the dark cloud does come over my life, you can stand in the midst of it, yet still be showered in your Father's love. And I can withstand the storm. Yes, the storm is horrible, and my soul's at angst, but I stand on the foundation that I am a loved daughter, I am a loved son of God. That is who I am. In the midst of the storm, we can experience unshakable peace 
because we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ and now God delights in us, loves us, and likes us. Here's number two. I love this one too. I love all of them. Number two, Jesus prays for you. Did you know that? That when Jesus right now is at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. You know how I can walk through a storm in life? Because I know he loves me. And I know my Savior, my Lord, is praying for me right now. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. John 17, 20, Jesus says this, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Romans 8 says this, 834, he also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. That's what he's doing for you. Talking to the Father and interceding on your behalf. The writer of Hebrews 7.25 says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. The only way to God is Jesus Christ. The only way. You can't be good enough to get your way into heaven. We gotta humbly submit and realize that sin is destructive in our lives and we need a God that will save us and he loved you enough to send his son in your place to take your sin and your shame and kill it on the cross for you and I to walk in the freedom of Jesus Christ now. And it's the only way, and he says, in that, he's at there always living to intercede for you and I. That's where he is. When the dark cloud comes, you and I can stand knowing that Christ is praying for us. So stand strong and don't give in to temptations. Your faith will not fail because of who he is if our eyes are fixed on the right thing. Whew. Here's the last one. <laughs> you know what's crazy about all three of these that I'm gonna share? What's crazy is Jesus is telling his disciples these things and this his last discourse with his disciples. Here's what's crazy. He knows they're going to leave him. He knows, Peter, you're going to deny me. And he's still reminding them, even knowing I'm gonna be hurt by these guys, the Father loves them. I love them. I'm going to be praying for him. If you know someone's going to hurt you, what would you do? Pray against them? Not love them? Jesus knows all this. He knows their storm is coming. But I'm here with them. And he reminds us key thing. Number three, hold on to this when the storm comes. Jesus will come to you through the Holy Spirit. Jesus says these words in John 14, and I wonder if the disciples were absolutely lost at that time. Because even the disciples still had this idea of their Savior, their Messiah, still being this one that will come militarily and overthrow Rome and get Israel back in its rightful space in the world empire. And Jesus says this in John 14. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor or advocate, the Greek word Parakletos, to be with you forever. He's the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I wonder if the disciples are like, no, Jesus, don't leave us. He says, no, 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 I'm going to. But know this, the counselor will come. You know when you and I need counseling? Well, all the time, <laughs> we all actually do. But definitely during the storm. And he's saying, the storm's coming, but don't worry. 
I'm going to be with you through the Holy Spirit that needs to come. And he will be with you and in you and work through you and be all around you. I will never leave you nor forsake you because I'm working through the Spirit of God. I can go through the storm knowing Jesus is right there with me through the Spirit of God living in me. I am never left alone in this world. Praise team, worship team, make your way up, please. Not for a second when that storm comes are you and I left alone. The counselor's there to bring clarity, strength, life, joy, to point us always back to Jesus. John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me, not in these things, that you numb through the storm, you numb yourself through the storm. This is a false sense of peace. And as we read, Paul says, we've died to these things, by the way. You're dead to this. You'll have peace in me. You will have suffering in this world. <laughs> these next few words, don't miss it. Be courageous. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. You know what's awesome about that? Jesus hasn't died yet. He hasn't resurrected yet. But he can see his victory on the other side of the storm he's about to encounter on the cross. He sees it. Lean in. In his victory, we are victorious. It's in his triumph, we are triumphant. This is who we are as sons and daughters of God. You are victorious. And in fact, 1 John 5, 4 reads this way. Because everyone who has been born of God, what do they do? What's that one word? They conquer. Because everyone who's been born of God conquers the world. If you've been born again, in deep, intimate knowledge and knowing and experience of who God is, you are a conqueror of the world. The cloud over you does not conquer you, but you now can conquer it. And you can withstand it. And you will walk through it. And the courage we need to get through this storm is only found in one name. And his name is Jesus. Amen. So, knowing that Jesus came and has conquered the world should bring us great joy this Christmas season. The cloud may be over me, but I got joy because Jesus has came and he's conquered and now I'm victorious, amen? Church family, will you stand? We're gonna sing joy to the world knowing who this Jesus is that we can have joy deep down in our soul.